Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our presentation today on the Research and Development Tax Credit. We will be starting in about four minutes, but in the meantime, if you want to choose your audio option, you can go to the audio tab and choose either the phone line to listen to or through your computer speakers. We will be offering CPE credit for this session. Uh, there are four attendance questions as we go through, so please make sure that you answer three out of the four of those questions. And also, uh, there is a copy of today's slides in the handouts uh, pod on the command strip. So you might want to go down there, go ahead and download a copy of the handout for today's session. If you have questions, please enter those in the questions pod, and you could go ahead and start uh, populating those. Our instructors will answer as many of those as they can during the session, and if they don't get to your question, they'll respond to you after the program. So thank you for joining us. We'll get started in about three minutes. Good afternoon. It is one o'clock Eastern and we are ready to begin our presentation. A couple of housekeeping notes. You may choose to listen through your the telephone line or through the computer. You may choose your choice of audio on using the audio tab on the command strip on the right hand side of your screen. Also, to earn CPE credit, there will be four attendance questions as we go through today's program. You'll have plenty of time to, to answer those, answer three out of the four, and we will log your attendance to issue a CPE credit. Um, also, the question pod is there. If you have questions during today's session, please input your questions in the questions pod. Uh, the instructors may be answering them there to you directly or in uh, as we go through the presentation, trying to address those questions, we get to as many as we can. If we cannot get to those, then we will respond to you uh, in an email afterwards. And finally, check out the handouts pod where there is a copy of today's slides. And you can um, use, uh, go ahead and pull that down and follow along there and also look for questions as we go. 
that's it for the announcements. I'm going to turn this over to Ron Wainwright, who is a partner in our tax practice and also the national leader for our credits and accounting methods uh, practice. And he's going to introduce the members of his team who will be speaking today. So, Ron. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for joining us today with respect to cash incentives for making improvements, i.e. the R&D tax credit. Uh, so we appreciate you joining us today. Let me introduce you a couple of my teammates as well as co-presenters. Uh, Kathleen Ehrlich uh, is a senior manager on the credits and accounting methods team with Cherry Becker. And Forrest Corwin is a manager on the credits and accounting methods team. Uh, both are uh, technical subject matter experts when it comes to the research and development credit. And uh, we will be covering the following in our agenda today. So we'd like to walk through defining the R&D credit, what expenses should be considered, LB&I current campaigns uh, from an internal revenue service perspective, just to give you an update, some international considerations with respect to the credit, discuss the domestic small business opportunities uh, or the startup and the ability to monetize the R&D credit against payroll taxes, talk to you a little bit about state tax credits, and then hot topics with respect to R&D. So yes, we have a lot to cover in, in the next hour, and so let's get started. So the first thing we would point out to you when it comes to the research and development credit is though it's been in the Internal Revenue Code since 1981 and has a long life and a long history, uh, it is a credit that is often overlooked by taxpayers and companies. However, as we all know, uh, we are in a new environment, a new world with respect to COVID-19. And every company now is evaluating and changing and evolving over this really last months and, and year. So most, if not all of those changes are likely R&D credit eligible. So when you think about a manufacturing facility, uh, you're reconfiguring your manufacturing layouts to accommodate for social distancing. Uh, you may change your lines and your layouts of those lines to ensure the appropriate distancing as well as uh, safety precautions are in place for your company as well as employees. So you're likely converting those production lines or adding uh, additional critical supplies uh, depending upon your supply chain. Uh, it is likely that you are evaluating new software enhancements to help with remote employees uh, to work more effectively and efficiently remotely. Uh, it is also likely you're changing your business model and redirecting your focus so as to uh, develop new products uh, to address issues and concerns that you may be having with respect to you as a company. Um, you are likely offering a new product or service to help with an immediate need of your customer, uh, whether that be a product or uh, changing your processes or technology or perhaps a new technique or design. It is likely you're changing software security measures uh, in this virtual world that we now live in and working remotely, if not working from uh, home or skeletal crew, crews uh, in your facilities. Uh, it is likely you're improving legacy products uh, to help minimize your cost in delivering that to your customers. It is likely you're evaluating changes in supplies and vendors so as to support a lower cost structure during these challenging times. Or you may simply be doing something beyond your ordinary workflow and what is necessary in these challenging times for your company's survival. So all of those items I identified and listed are in fact what would be deemed to be activities uh, that potentially are qualified research activities. And that brings us to our first polling question. So our poll is open. Uh, go ahead and launch that uh, polling question for folks to input. I can see their, your answers are coming in. I'll share that in just a moment. Uh, this, is, this is great. Um, so Ron, uh, we heard a lot about some manufacturers switching over from their normal products to PPE equipment and things. Uh, that that transition to a new product line and how do you build this and um, those safety equipment that 
that needed to be created and manufactured by a company, those are those are ideal candidates for considering uh, an R and D credit. Correct, as well as other industries. So when you think of the R and D credit, uh, we often refer to it as a industry agnostic credit. Uh, and you'll hear later in the presentation when we begin to define the business components of you're developing something new or improved to you as the taxpayer in dealing with a product or dealing with a process change such as the COVID-19 requirements um, or going into a technology and you're developing software or you may be a technology company as well. Um, R&D activities are really occurring in every taxpayer in the United States. Some activities obviously are more vertically aligned than others. The examples we wanted to kind of point out are broad examples that are impacting really every industry when you think about this new environment and these new challenges. All right, so let me close this poll and I'll share, uh, share the results so that everybody can see that for just a moment. All right. Good. So, we will so let me now uh, pivot into what and how do we define the R&D credit? So let me introduce my teammate, uh, Kathleen Ehrlich, who goes by Cat, and turn it over to Cat. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, and yes, the R&D credit, <clears throat> it is a general business credit under code section 41 for companies that are incurring costs that Ron had just mentioned um, around development and research costs that are being performed here in the United States. This government-sponsored tax incentive was created to incentivize companies to keep technical jobs here in the U.S. Now, this credit is a dollar-for-dollar -dollar credit, which is better than a reduction, that can be used to help offset current and future tax liabilities and possibly even offset some payroll costs if you're a qualified business, which we'll touch on later in the slides. One thing to note is that this credit is not only a federal credit, but there are also some state credits that are available. And Forrest will highlight some of those state credits and some changes that have recently occurred in the uh, last two years. Now, this credit is mainly driven by a labor-based or internal wages credit. And that's one of the things that we're going to focus a little bit on as we go through these slides. Now, the R&D tax credit eligibility largely depends on whether the activities your company is conducting meets the special criteria that's been established by the IRS in the four part test seen here on the slides. Now, with these four parts, I'm going to kind of mix them up a little bit just to keep you on your toes. But I'm going to start from the far right with the business component. Now that business component is also known as the permitted purpose component. So here what we're looking for are that the activities that your company perform are just what kind of Ron said, new to you creating something new or improved around a product or a process that results in an increase in performance, reliability, functionality, or quality. Now that new business component can be a product or a process. It can also be a formula, a, a technique, an invention, or even a piece of software. So as you can see, that definition becomes quite broad when considering a business component. So now you've set out and you've identified that you have a new business component. Well, the next step is to, deter, excuse me, is to determine if you have a technical uncertainty. And here we're looking that the activities conducted by your company have demonstrated that you've attempted to eliminate any technical uncertainty regarding in the development or the improvement of that business component. So what kind of technical issues did your company face? Now we're not talking business challenges. Do we have enough resources? Do we have enough staff? Do we have the know-how? More along the line, do we have the technical know-how? How can we do it? How will we do it? Is the uh, answers that we look for from the technical uncertainty. Now, following along with that would be the process of experimentation. Because such technical uncertainties existed, what types of experimentation did your company go through in order to determine that you had technical uncertainty? Did you evaluate cert <clears throat> certain alternatives? Did you model? Did you simulate? Did you run a Kaizen event? Did you run a lean event? 
those types of activities would prove that you had a process of experimentation to solve your technical uncertainties. The fourth and final test that we like to rely upon is called the technological in nature test. And here this just states that all the activities that you're conducting that were in the first three tests were relying on a hard science. So that can be engineering, physics, chemistry, biology, or like I said, computer science. We try to eliminate anything in the soft sciences or survey type activities. If your company is doing all four parts of this, then you're likely in the R&D space. Let's talk a little bit about some potential activities that could qualify for the credit. As I mentioned, product development is probably the most easiest to spot. The other ones that fall under there are ones that we want you to consider as well. Process optimization, are you thinking about how to improve your yield? Design engineering, what types of activities are you doing that would fall in this category? Environmental and regulate, regulatory, think about what we just talked about with the COVID regulations. Are you running any trials or pilots? And finally, that software development can definitely qualify as well. Not only software development that your customers are using, but it could be software development that you need to run your own business or software development to run your manufacturing machines. It's quite a diverse area that we want you to think about and consider as a qualifying activity as well. Now, we were talking about earlier that this is basically a labor-based uh, credit, and that's where we generally find a lot of activities happening. Well, how do we do that? What do we do? What do we look for? We look for people that are directly performing R&D. They've got their sleeves rolled up. They're doing the research. <clears throat> Those people are definitely qualifying. And in fact, if they're doing spending at least 80% of their time on a research type activity, we're actually able to include 100% of that person's time, which is great because if we can include 100% of that person's box one W2, that's much better than including an 80%. There's also two other categories that we look to. Who is helping directly supervise the people that are performing the R&D activities? Are they reviewing tests? Are they helping lead the development efforts? Their time can be considered as well. Then we look to the third place, which would be directly supporting activities. Who in your company are supporting those activities? Do you have sales engineers that are going out into the field, collecting information, bringing it back to the company, and then the company is all of a sudden producing something new or improved? Are there customer service people that are involved that are talking to your customers and gathering information to find where there's functional gaps? Do you have a Q&A or a QC uh, group that have discovered something along trying to finalize a product where there's something that's not quite leading up to code and they have to make some changes? Once the engineers start making those changes again, there could be some opportunity that the QC, QA people were involved. And absolutely some calibrating of, of, uh, of machinery could potentially qualify, especially if you're trying to change those manufacturing lines to help with social distancing. And now recalibrating those machines have now come into play. So those are some great activities to think about. Let's go over a quick practical example. And excuse me while I read this because it's, there's no better way to talk this through. This is a practical example of company ABC that actually obtained some samples of some green paint from a supplier. And they determined that they had to modify its green paint process in order to accommodate the green paint because this green paint had different characteristics from previous paints that they had used. Now they ob obtained some detailed da data on the green paint from their paint supplier. Along with that, they also have to consult with their manufacturer to find out what they should be doing. Well, the manufacturing informs them that the company has to get a new no nozzle in order to be able to use the green paint the way they want to. So ABC company tests the new nozzle to make sure that it works properly and that the manufacturer of the paint who supplied it and it works to the intent that they needed to. So in thinking about that four part test, does this activity qualify for the research tax credit? And the short answer here is no. And the reason is because the activities just didn't have a process of experimentation. The company didn't evaluate any alternatives in regarding the painting process. And what I have here on this slide is a couple of examples of R&D activities 
I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just put some couple up here that I thought would we could highlight. For example, if you are designing some tools, jigs, molds, or, or dies, those activities could qualify for the credit. If you're improving or testing some new concepts, some new theories, some new techniques or formulas, that too could qualify. And there's a couple other there's you, you could look for look at as examples, but we just wanted to highlight a few of, of those examples for you. And with that, I'd like to pass it now to my colleague, Forrest, who's gonna talk about some expenses to consider. Forrest? Thanks, Kat. So what Kat just went over was talking about what type of activities qualify for the research and development tax credit. So now we kind of wanna move on to what expenses you guys can pick up to go towards calculating that credit and generating that credit. That's kind of step two of the process. Step one being identifying the activities, making sure they qualify, they can be substantiated, and then identifying actual qualifying research expenses that can be picked up to calculate it. So the four big expenses are gonna be wages, supplies, contract research, and rental or lease of computer costs. In the next slide, I'll go into a little bit more detail about each of those um, and the specifics of what we can pick up and how it kind of works for the credit. How much is the credit? So the credit, as Ron and Kat mentioned before, um, it differs from a deduction in a good way in that it is an actual dollar for dollar offset against taxes owed or paid. So it's really beneficial for companies that can claim this. Um, it's a huge incentive, cash is king, and it's a great way to generate cash savings um, immediately in, in many cases. A business can receive a credit equal anywhere from six and a half to 20% of the total qualifying research expenditures that we're gonna go over in the next slide. So going to those potential qualifying costs that we kind of were mentioned quickly on the prior slide, the biggest driver of the credit usually is gonna be the wage costs. So that's the time that your employees are spending doing qualifying research activities. So as Kat kind of mentioned, we can pick up people who are you know, directly doing qualifying activities, supervising and supporting. Um, so for example, if John Smith spends 50% of his time doing qualifying research activities, we can pick up 50% of his box one W2 wages to go towards the credit. And as Kat mentioned, there's that 80% threshold. So if it's above 80%, we can take 100%. That's usually gonna be the biggest driver of the credit because it's that time that your employees are spending trying to improve, or develop new product or processes. The second kind of thing that we can pick up from a expense standpoint is supplies. It's a little bit more narrow in scope because it has to be supplies that are used and consumed during the R&D process. It can't be anything that's capitalized or depreciated or has a useful life beyond R&D. But if you think of it um, in the sense of a prototype where you guys are building a prototype, you might have raw materials, you might scrap that prototype, any of those type of costs that go into that could definitely be picked up as qualifying supply costs. Um, another example that we sometimes give is if you're working in a lab environment, you have test strips, um, you use up that test strip during the course of experimentation, it doesn't have another useful life it's consumed during the R&D process and it can definitely be a qualifying supply cost they could pick up. Third, third type of qualifying cost is contract research. So this is where you guys are paying a third party contractor or a consultant to do qualifying activities for your company. If, um, if you, the payments that you guys make towards these contractors, you can pick up a portion, about 65% of the payments made to it. Um, a few things to highlight when it comes to contract research expenses is there's a few hurdles you have to overcome in order to claim that expense. The first just being that you have to own the rights to the research. So whatever type of qualifying research and development they are doing for you, the contract that's involved with the contractors and consultants, you just have to make sure that the language includes that you guys own the intellectual property, that you own the rights to it, and also need to demonstrate that the economic risk um, is on the company claiming the credit. Fourth one that on the prior slide was listed as rental and lease of, of computer costs. The more modern term for that, or the more modern example for that for today's um, companies that are claiming the credit is really gonna be the amount of money that companies spend on cloud computing costs. 
So for example, a company that uses AWS or Google Cloud or any of the many cloud service providers out there, if you guys were paying a cloud hosting service fee and you guys were conducting R&D activities on the cloud, then you can potentially pick up the payments made towards those cloud hosting service um, fees. So it's another opportunity to um, get some savings and generate a bigger credit. The last one kind of listed on this slide is extraordinary utilities. This one does technically fall under the supply cost, but it's a, it's a little different, so we wanted to highlight it real quickly. What this is, is that you have to prove out that you have an extraordinary expense around a utility. Example, if you're having, you know, using gas for a manufacturing facility, and if it is an extraordinary different amount, if it's a separate pipeline, for example, that goes to a separate manufacturing line, and that separate pipeline of gas is being used to conduct R&D activities, then you can potentially and most likely pick up that payment that you guys are making for that extraordinary use of utility and that extraordinary gas for the R&D activities. And in the example I just gave, where you have a separate pipe, it would be easy to prove out that expense being separate because you would most likely have a separate bill that would come and you'd be able to bifurcate the costs. Another example, if you don't have a completely separate line, but you are using an extraordinary amount of utilities for R&D, is for example, if you have a 12,000 square foot property um, and you're using an extraordinary amount of utility for R&D, and there's a similar property with a similar square footage, but their gas utility is much lower than yours, and the reason it's much lower is because you're using a lot more for R&D, then you can use that as a fact pattern to prove out that you are using an extra amount of utilities, gas in this example, for R&D purposes, and you can pick up those qualifying expenses to go towards the credit. All right, that brings us to our next uh, poll question. So let me get that launched. This is your attendance polling question. So if you will, when that shows up on your screen, go ahead and uh, pick an answer to that. Uh, as we go through, I did see a couple of questions come in. A couple we're going to address later in the program as we move um, move forward. They're, they're addressed in there. Uh, and so we've covered now pretty much the basic overview. Everybody's got a good general understanding of the R&D activities and R&D credits <clears throat> or expenses that generate the credit. Uh, next, we're going to move into areas about you know how the IRS is approaching those, what's happening uh, more to date, and uh, keep you updated now that we've got this sort of basic understanding uh, recorded. So I think uh, I'm seeing that a lot of you are answering the poll. I'll give you just another about another 10 seconds to make sure that you get your answer recorded here uh, for CPE credit for those of you who would like that. All right, got uh, it's just about done there, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll in about just a little bit more. Okay, and I'll share the results with you. You guys got uh, did very well on this. Uh, yes, any one of those wages, supplies, contract research. All of those or any of those can count for the R&D credit if they're properly uh, properly structured and, and properly recorded and identified. So well done on that. And so let me close the close this down and we'll go back to our presentation. And uh, so who's going to talk to us about um, uh, LBNI and the IRS now? Uh, so, Sarah, this is Ron. Uh, so, we always want to make sure that we address questions and concerns as to, uh, well, what is my likelihood of examination in the event that I, I claim the R&D credit? Uh, I would tell you there's a lot of uh, misinformation out there in regards to uh, the R&D credit and examinations. Uh, a point I would make is you are in the event, because I saw on the initial poll, uh, a number of uh, the participants today have not claimed the credit before. So as a matter of tax law, you may go backwards as long as the statute of limitations is open. Um, so that basically means that you've got a three-year look back. 
so as long as the statute of limitations is open under 6511, we can go back and amend uh, a entity return and claim the credit. Uh, and then as we'll talk further, that credit can be carried back one year and, and forward 20 years. Um, so we always wanna make sure we address uh, kind of the examination potential and what really happens from an IRS perspective. Uh, a couple items I'd like to mention is you noted, I, I commented that the R&D credit section 41 and specifically 174, which talks about our cost incurred items has been in the Internal Revenue Code since 1981. So it has a long life, a long history. Uh, since 1981, it has only been out of the tax law uh, beyond all the changes since that period of time uh, for a six month period. This was only one of two credits that was identified in a bipartisanship manner underneath the Tax Cuts Jobs Act of 2017 to be retained and sustained in uh, the tax law. So as uh, rate reduction occurred, uh, the only two credits was the low income housing tax credit, as well as the research and development credit. Uh, the most recent information we have, just as a point of data, is that in 2014, uh, the Internal Revenue Service put an information release out there that said that of all eligible taxpayers in the United States that could claim the credit, that had qualified research activities and had qualified research expenses, less than 35% of those eligible taxpayers claim the credit, and the majority of those taxpayers understated the credit. Having said that, in 2014, which is yes, dated information, we do not have information on 2015 yet, um, $10.5 billion of dollar for dollar tax liability reductions occurred in the 2014 year alone. So it is a significant federal subsidy in regards to a deduction first for your cost incurred, and then in turn, a credit at the federal and uh, as Forrest will talk, state level subsequently. So, so let's talk a little bit about LBNI, which is often uh, the acronym uh, for those uh, who know it, it's Large Business and International Division Examinations. So just a couple updates. On January of 2017, LBNI announced uh, the identification and selection of 13 initial campaigns. Now this is done frequently, uh, depending on who the commissioner is, as well as uh, IRS resources. Because in theory, what's happening here is because of the compliance and also the resource challenges, the service is attempting to identify areas of tax law that in fact, either they wish to examine more thoroughly um, and or they are identifying to the taxpayers where they see aggressive claims. Uh, but that's not what occurred in January 31st of 2017 attributable to the R&D credit. Again, these campaigns were to identify uh, and recognize from an IRS resource perspective, how do we want to deploy our resources? What type of training and tools do we need to make sure our examiners are armed to, as to examine uh, the complexity of a uh, a specific area of tax law. And it was also based on feedback that they were seeing in prior examinations. So it was really uh, a, a strategic planning event. Um, so what occurred was they issued a directive to examiners regarding the audits of research tax credits under the Internal Revenue Code. Again, this is in uh, 2017. And basically they created a safe harbor and they set a presumption of qualified expenses. Um, and for those of you who may be on the, I'll say uh, the accounting side of your uh, taxpayer's house, they basically indicated, we're going to give a safe harbor underneath ASC 730, which is the uh, pronouncement that deals with how you account for financial statement R&D. Um, and basically they told their agents that when it comes to ASC 730, and the applicable financial statements, uh, we're going to honor what uh, the audit side or the accounting side of the house have done in regards to that pronouncement. Um, and that's going to begin a starting point for us in the event of an examination. Uh, now, I will tell you that um, 
right now, and uh, we are not in any way, shape, or form about the audit lottery. Uh, but I can tell you that the examination rate on a percentage basis of R&D credit claims, whether that be amended uh, returns going backwards or prospective claims, is less than 1%. Um, so uh, we do not run the audit lottery as a firm. We're very conservative, uh, but that is an actual percentage um, insofar as questions that we often get. So let's talk about a couple recent updates. So uh, underneath the new commissioner, uh, Commissioner Reddick, um, and again, uh, going back to the LBNI directive in 2017, he announced two more campaign issues beyond the 13 originally announced. And one of those was the research tax credit. Um, and then the other one was the fuels credit. Um, now this was uh, done specifically uh, attributable to what we'll cover now is why and what was the objective and then of course the how. So the why is what they were seeing was the issues involving section 41 and 174 uh, from an R&D credit were actually some of the most prevalent tax issues within the LBNI division. And more specifically, they were utilizing significant examination and taxpayer resources to examine the R&D credit. Um, so their objective was to really promote a voluntary compliance underneath these campaigns, to really focus the IRS resources on the, on the highest risk areas within an R&D credit when you think about the four part and the seven part test, uh, as well as what uh, four is covered in regards to section 174 and, and the cost incurred. Um, so they really were trying to promote voluntary compliance by taxpayers, doing the right thing, but also they wanted to create consistency in really an issue-based examination and a form update and standardized information document request. Um, and so, uh, we hear a lot of questions about this new LBI initiative. Obviously, it was released in 2020, and we know the challenging times that uh, we are living in. Um, our experience is it is likely this is where the resources are, even though we have two new campaigns, um, will be focused uh, given some of the areas that we'll talk about in the international provisions. But we wanted to give you at least an update because we often get a lot of questions. Now, a point of information is you can technically go back 20 years. As long as a taxpayer has losses, uh, you can go back beyond 6511 in the statute and capture those credits and carry them forward. Uh, so we did get a question in the, uh, the box that I'd like to address. Can a partnership who operates at a loss that does not qualify for the payroll tax still take advantage of the credit? And how would they... Uh, actually gain what we would refer to as a monetization and would the 20 year carry forward work if the partnership had a loss. Uh, so two items to point out uh, under section 41. And so yes, uh, the partnership can certainly take advantage of the R&D credit because the credit is actually uh, generated at the entity level. It is ultimately passed through uh, to the underlying partners. And so any income that is generated uh, that would be subject to self-employment taxes or employment taxes attributable to that partnership by that partner who is receiving the pass-through at the federal and state level uh, can be considered in the utilization and ultimate monetization uh, of that. So, you know, think about guaranteed payments, uh, some other areas that are going to be subject to employment taxes uh, coming out of the partnership. Obviously, we know not the W-2. Um, the other item I would point out is, yes, uh, you are eligible for a 20-year carry forward um, by year. Uh, so that is one of the reasons it's important to go ahead and capture the credit, because obviously it's a 20-year carry forward and a one-year carry back. Um, and obviously we don't expect that partnership to be in losses for the next 20 years, um, given their new products and processes that they're developing. Which brings us to polling question number three. Sarah? Sorry, I moved the polling question. We're going to um, go forward with uh, the international tax considerations, and we'll pick up the polling question uh, in a few more slides. All right, very good. Keeping you all on your toes, including myself. Uh, so I will turn it over to my uh, teammate, uh, Kat, who is going to cover some of the international tax considerations when we think about these fun items in Tax Cuts Jobs Act of uh, guilty and some of the foreign tax credit limitations. So Kat? 
John. So one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about is the Treasury Reg 1-861-17. This is a Treasury Reg that talks about how R&D expenditures should be uh, apportioned and allocated. And the reason this is coming up now is because uh, back in the day, pretty much international tax was done in, in, in its own silo and R&D was kind of done in its own silo. And now that things have changed, it, they've become more intertwined. The 174 research costs have always been able to be expensed or you could capitalize them under 59E. But now that we've got Guilty and FIDI and, and all these other new uh, things that have come out, these tre this treasury reg has kind of dipped its way into the R&D world. And one of the things we wanted to highlight today is to talk about that, the fact that the research expenditures um, are not apportioned to guilty. And it's very important for you to be able to identify where your R&D expenditures are um, and are you capturing all of them in the appropriate places. Um, one of the things that we want to highlight is that you know 174 is not following book. Um, so it becomes even more prevalent to make sure that you are appropriately putting them in the right places and apportioning them. Because as you know, to start with your 41 costs, you, you look to your 174 costs first, and then it filters down into, into 41. So consider this as you're, as you're booking them and making sure you're making the right apportionments because there is some um, new legislation that um, is going to be coming our way in the next year or two, possibly, um, which Ron will highlight in, in, in a little bit. But going on to our next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the beat. So um, concerned about base stripping and um, base erosion. Congress passed Section 59A, which we now refer to as the as, as BEAT, which is Base Erosion Anti-Abuse Tax. Now, BEAT allows some tax payments from U.S. Corps to their foreign, I'm sorry, disallows, excuse me, some uh, payments to U.S. Corps to their foreign affiliates. And that becomes interesting because if you're a BEAT taxpayer, the R&D credit is the only credit that's available to be utilized by a BEAT taxpayer. Even foreign tax credit, which has been around forever as well, <laughs> um, you're not able to utilize that. So my point here is that if you are a BEAT taxpayer, think about utilizing that R&D tax credit because in a couple of years, uh, right now the way it's slated, 2026, 20, 20, I'm pretty sure, and the, if you're a BEAT taxpayer and you have, beat, you have that liability, you're not gonna be able to utilize the R&D credits or any credits for that matter. So just something to consider when you're doing your tax planning right now. And on to our next slide, it looks like I get to kick off the polling question. So Sarah. Great. All right, so our next polling question, uh, which department in the company generally performs qualified R&D of these that are listed? Uh, which of these departments do you think would be your go-to place for looking for R&D credits, uh, credit activities and expenses, I should say, activities and expenses? All right, I'll give you just a, another um, 30 or so seconds to find to find out about. We do, you know, the uh, Taxpayers who are subject to the base erosion and avoidance tax, that beat tax, um, those are pretty large companies, but we mentioned it here, even though we work with uh, middle market companies frequently, is that uh, these, our companies, your companies are the ones that are frequently picked up uh, by larger companies, pulled into, um, uh, you, you're creating the products and services that are desired by larger companies. And so it's not unusual for an operation to be pulled into a company, a big international company that is a uh, subject to the beat tax by stretch. All right, uh, just another couple of minutes for you. If you have not answered the polling question, 
please go ahead and do so. And uh, I will share the results on this. See, many of you have gone ahead and answered. I'll give you just another 10 seconds to answer here and share that. Okay, just a couple more of you to, to respond. If I may, while we're seeing some responses, the other reason we wanted to highlight uh, the uh, the beat and, and guilty uh, type information and how it uh, the R&D credit impacts it is we recognize that over the last years, number of companies, likely you all, uh, have outsourced, uh, specifically when it comes to technology uh, resources, uh, as well as potentially you have manufacturing facilities or other facilities uh, in a worldwide footprint. Uh, so we uh, actually do work from an R&D perspective um, internationally, and there are a number of countries uh, that have recently adopted some new legislation, and I'll highlight two, uh, specifically the United Kingdom now has a uh, refundable credit for R&D in the event that you were to have uh, an R&D facility um, or you're outsourcing into the United Kingdom, uh, as well as Germany. Uh, Germany uh, was released January 20, uh, as well as uh, the United Kingdom. So the UK's is 12.5% uh, uh, of your R&D spend uh, occurring in uh, the United Kingdom. And then Germany um, has actually a uh, 500,000 euro refundable credit up to a spend of, uh, of 2 million euros in regards to R&D. So uh, we look for R&D not just uh, occurring domestically uh, in the United States, but also those uh, that may have presence uh, outside of the United States, given the outsourcing that had occurred and has occurred over the last you know, five to 10 years. And so uh, we'll, we'll go to the domestic small business opportunities. And uh, that is my colleague, Boris Corwin. Boris? Thanks, Ron. Um, so here we want to talk about domestic small business opportunities. So. Obviously, as we covered, the R&D tax credit is a great opportunity to offset, you know, a dollar for dollar offset of your tax liability. But the IRS recognized that there's a lot of small businesses and startups that are in losses, and they wanted to create an opportunity for them to be able to monetize the credit immediately. So if you qualify, you can monetize up to 250,000 of, of your R&D credit against your payroll taxes. Um, in order to qualify, you have to meet basically two tests. Um, the first test being that looking at your current year and a five-year look back, you can't have more than $5 million of gross receipts in that current year or any of the years in the five-year look back. And then the second test is prior to that five-year look back, you can't have any gross receipts. So as long as you meet those two tests, um, you qualify to elect to, you qualify to be able to use your payroll, to, to use your R&D credit to offset your payroll taxes which is a great opportunity if you're in losses to monetize it immediately. The election is made annually on form 6765, which is the form that you fill out with your tax return to claim the credit. It's currently in section D. So at the bottom of the form, you will check the box that will say you want to use the credit and use it against your payroll taxes. Um, you claim with the first payroll quarter beginning after the tax return is filed, meaning that if you file your tax return in Q2, then you'll be able to start monetizing the credit against your payroll taxes in the quarter after the tax return is filed. So in that example, it would be in Q3 is when you would start monetizing it against payroll. The election is limited to five taxable years. Um, it doesn't have to be consecutive though. Excess credits are rolled forward to the next payroll quarter. So if you know, you're a startup and you don't have a ton of payroll taxes, but you do have a large credit, um, you might not use it all up in one quarter, but it's still great. You can use it up then immediately just rolls forward automatically to the next quarter and to the next quarter until you're able to monetize it. And the deduction is for the employer payroll tax allowed for the credited amounts. This kind of is a good graph that kind of not only demonstrates how it works, but also how you kind of qualify. As I mentioned before, it shows that five-year look back period that none of those years in the current year you're trying to take it, you can't have more than $5 million gross receipts. And then prior to that five year look back, so in this example, those 2012, 2013 years, they don't have any gross receipts. So this company definitely qualifies to use the credit against their payroll taxes. So in this example, you know, the company in 2019 claims R&D credit of $75,000. 
Step one is they look at the current year and use the credit to reduce their tax liability. Step two would be to look back to the prior year for potential carryback of the credit to reduce tax. And then step three is they could look forward to elect to use some or all of the remaining credit to offset 2020 payroll tax in the next available quarter. So as I said, it just kind of rolls forward if you can't monetize it all in that one quarter. There's a three-step reporting requirement when it comes to claiming the credit to offset payroll taxes. So the first step mentioned before is you're filing your form 6765 with your tax return. It's on section D. Um, you have to make the election on that form that you're specifying that you're using your credit to offset payroll taxes. The second step is you have to file form 8974. This is used to report the amount of R&D elected on the 6765 to offset your payroll. Um, I like to explain it usually that the 8974 is really a bridge between the tax return and towards the form 941, which is where you're going to have your payroll information. So the, it, the form 8974 must be filed each quarter with the form 941. That's how it's kind of a bridge. And the form 941 includes the amount reported, um, includes the amount reported that you're going to use to offset pay payroll taxes. And we usually, when we work with our clients to monetize the credit this way, we'll get in touch with their payroll provider and we'll work with them to work them through the process of how to get it on your form 941 and monetize it as fast as we can after the tax return is filed. AMT offset with R&D credits. So eligible small businesses or their owners, they may also use the R&D credits to reduce their alternative minimum tax liabilities. Um, this is eligible for eligible small businesses, which is defined in Section 38 C5, a business with average annual gross receipts of 50 million or less for the three preceding taxable years. Um, an important thing to highlight is partnership or S corporations. The gross receipts test is applied at the individual owner level. Again, unused R&D credits for the 19 tax year of an eligible small business may be carried back one year to offset any AMT liability for that for the 2018 tax year. And then further, again, the R&D credits can be carried forward 20 years to offset future AMT liabilities, which creates, again, another way for a company to monetize the credit using it to offset and reduce their AMT. Moving on to states. As mentioned before, obviously the credit can be applied at the federal level, but there's also a lot of opportunity to apply the credit and to claim the credit in 36 states that use the R&D tax credit. So we still have a lot of information left in our program, so we'll, I'll just kind of walk through these real quickly. Just wanted to kind of highlight some of the big ones, a lot of the ones we encountered. Texas um, is one that we use a lot with our clients. It, confirms to, it conforms to the federal, uses the same type of calculation. Um, New Jersey, it's available. Um, it can also be used for, um, it, it, it's used the same way, again, as Texas. You, the calculation is the same way. Florida, um, an application must be completed in March. There's a certification letter that must be completed by the Florida Department of Economic that certifies you are approved for it, but it's a pretty easy process. We work through it with a lot of our clients. They have about 9 million in credit available, at least historically. Pennsylvania is another state. They just started a new online system in 2018. It's an online portal. It's made the process even easier, in my opinion. Um, it allows you to fill out all the information online, which we do for our clients. We fill in that information, we apply for the credit, and then you find out the awarded amount. Um, the applications due in September, usually find you find out how much amount you get awarded in October or November. A few other states, Georgia is another really great one. Um, one of the great incentives about Georgia, is you can go back to prior years that you didn't claim it. So usually you can go back three years. So if you're claiming for 2019, we could also go back to 18, 17, and potentially even 16 depending on the statute of limitations and claim the credit for Georgia if that's where your activities are taking place. South Carolina, similarly, you can go back. Um, the South Carolina credit is 5% of the qualified research expenditures. It's a very easy one to calculate and claim if you're doing work there. And it's a really great incentive. Virginia is very popular. It, it, it involves an application process where you apply. Um, historically, it has been due on July 1st, but because of COVID, they extended it this year where the applications are due September 1st. 
so you can apply September by September 1st. Um, you can apply for most companies, the max amount you can get is 45,000. And then depending on the amount of applications and the money available, you might receive um, less than that, but it's another great opportunity and it's a, it's a refundable credit. So that's one that's very attractive. All right, we're up to our uh, next polling question. I uh, wanted to make sure we got this one in. So I'll go ahead and launch launch this before we talk about some hot topics. Um, uh, so the question is, a qualified small business can offset up to $250,000 of payroll tax expense with the R&D tax credit. True, false, or not sure. So uh, let's get that one answered. And then we've got a few court cases in, uh, to cover next, just as a reminder about uh, the, the egregious errors that clients have taxpayers have made that the IRS have taken advantage of in uh, in taking a look at at the R&D credits claimed on certain tax returns. I believe uh, that so while you all are completing, yeah. while you're completing the survey, I wanted to make sure I highlighted a couple things. This is Ron. Uh, so when we talk about state credits, uh, actually 47 states now have adopted uh, the federal uh, tax legislation. And we had in the prior slide, Tennessee, no credit available. It was intentional in highlighting the following is many states actually claim the credit on equipment that is utilized. So Tennessee is one of those states. You're eligible for a credit, not in the traditional R&D credit sense, but you're eligible for a credit on any machinery and equipment that is utilized in the R&D activity. Um, also, I'd point out that at the state level, whether that be uh, South Carolina or whether that be Texas, at the state level, you can offset the, uh, utilize the credit both against income tax and your franchise tax. So that's often an, a, uh, an opportunity to minimize your state tax liabilities as well. And so, Sarah? Okay, we are ready to move, move forward here. Great, thank you. This is Kat Ehrlich. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some cases. Um, in 2019, we had a lot of key issues that came up for debate, and we wanna highlight some of those cases and how they impact the R&D claims. I'm gonna go through these quickly, but there's additional information on the slides if you wanna read through them. But there's the first case we have here is the Seymour Miller case. This was a company that was founded in 1950. They were a wheat company, and they had flour manufacturing mills in Illinois and Kentucky. In 2011 and 2012, they claimed credits for about nine of their manufacturing process improvements, and I think a couple on the products. Well, the tax court rejected their claim and said that they failed to show a process of experimentation. However, one great thing that, or actually two great things came out of this case that were taxpayer favorable. Um, one was that the commissioner had originally said that the client needed to have new technical uncertainties for each year spanning that they were claiming the credit. And the tax court rejected this position and said that your technical uncertainties can roll over from one year to the next. So you don't necessarily have to have new technical uncertainties, you just need to have them in each year. Another point that came out was the commissioner argued that the company didn't employ anyone with scientific sounding titles. And again, the tax court rejected that nothing was required for the taxpayer to um, employ these types of people. And a few years ago, IDRs that we were seeing come out, um, they asked for this type of information. They wanted resumes, degrees, and certifications. But more recently, the IDRs, the um, information document requests that the IRS sends out when you're being audited, replace this with discussions about how the people are performing R&D activities. So it's great to see that that this information is now coming out as being consistent in this court case. So moving on to Harper. So Harper was a construction company focusing on military designs. And in 2008 and 2010, they put a claim in for $800,000. But ultimately their claim was denied. And this was mostly because the taxpayer didn't provide sufficient information to the, to the IRS so that they could make administrative intelligent review of the claim. So basically what happened here is they submitted a claim and they didn't have any documentation to support it. So one of the things we wanted to highlight here is to make sure you've got substantiating documentation. It's critical in order to be able to sustain your claim. 
that's from two points. One is from the number side. What do you have to support the numbers that you're taking, which would be trial balances and box W-2s and invoices, but also what do you have from a, a quantitative point? How do you prove that your company is performing those types of activities that meet that four-part test that we mentioned earlier? Are you locking down meeting minutes and are you creating project interviews and overviews? Those are all important and point came out of the Harper case. Our next case we have, and on the next slide I think is Populous. So Populous um, was a problem with their, their contracts. They were an architectural company that claimed the credit in 2010 and 11 for about 100 projects. So the IRS and Populous identified five contracts that they would sit down and review. And they reviewed contracts that were, um, all the contracts they, that they chose were firm fixed price. And um, let's see, to talk about a high level, all contracts have to have what we call the, um, the right to develop the research and the economic risk associated with that. And the judge here determined that the economic risk was, the, was there in the firm fixed price. They, they cited Fairchild and, and Geosyntec decision in reaching their determination. But then when they went to the substantial rights, the IRS didn't think that the company had the rights to the development. They said, well, you know what, three of your contracts, there's copyrights in there. So they didn't think that they qualified. But here the judge noted that the rights didn't have to be, didn't need to be exclusive. They only had to be substantial. And because the taxpayer was able to reuse their research without paying the client any royalties or um, they were allowed to reuse this information, the judge in conclusion said that, yeah, Populous did have the economic right as well as the uh, risks associated with, those, with their projects. Um, so this again was another taxpayer friendly um, outcome. Our last case is our auto, auto technica. And this here, we had uh, a government file a notice with the US Board of Appeals of the Sixth, Sixth, excuse me, Sixth Circuit to appeal the outcome of a case that was heard. Something interesting here was this is the first time a jury has ever heard an R&D case. And what they concluded was, well, in an earlier settlement, the IRS came out and said uh, they had a certain settlement on their fixed, bright, fixed base percentage. And that's a percentage that kind of lives and dies with you as a company unless you have acquisitions or dispositions. So it's a pretty important number. The IRS came out with what they wanted to do with that number and granted them a certain percentage to be able to use going forwards. Well, the IRS said, no, we don't think that that was the right number and we want to change that number. And the company came back and said, well, you can't change it. We already had it settled earlier. Well, the IRS and the court agreed, you know what, we can make that change. The IRS isn't barred from using that prior year settlement um, and was able to um, make, suggest that they, they, they disagreed. Well, now the court is, if you see here uh, the date of this, 6-26-20, they're coming back and appealing it again and they, they're trying to determine what those next steps are gonna be. So all these uh, are four great cases uh, on different uh, areas that we're seeing and we expect more information to be coming down the pipe as we as we finish off uh, our 2020 year. So as we get to our last uh, last slides here, um, we want to talk about make sure that we cover you know what's happening today because we we know that 2020 is in a difficult play, place and there's been some significant changes with the CARES Act dealing with federal net operating losses and what does that mean when it comes to R and D credits? So um, one of the things that the CARE Act is, is talk, was talking about was they were going to um, be able to carry back your, your NOLs. And what happens for R&D is you actually get to carry back those NOLs to years that might be closed. And if the, the tax years are closed, um, they now get opened again. And since they're getting opened, those R&D credits are now available to roll forwards. So you now have credits that are opened that would have normally been closed in, in tax years. So that's been something that's, you know, and if you can't use those credits now, it's like Ron said, you can always roll them forwards for 20 years and keep them in your pocket to have those future uh, taxable offsets, taxable liability offsets. 
we have reached the two o'clock hour. So we, I thank you for this. We've got some, the last piece we didn't get to was some legislation proposed, which is having a hard time making out of Congress. So Ron, any final words before we wrap up here? No, um, on behalf of Cherry Becker, uh, Sarah McGregor, myself, Kathleen Ehrlich, and Forrest, we thank you for taking time out uh, to spend with us uh, an hour. We hope it was uh, informational and uh, gave you some things to think about. If you have any follow-up questions, uh, we will be reaching out to you as well. Uh, please, you have our emails on the sli uh, slide. And uh, we, again, thank you for your time. We know everyone is very busy. So everybody have a great day. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you to Kat and to Forrest and to Ron. Uh, for those of you who are looking for CPE credit, um, it'll be a little bit of time, uh, a couple of weeks maybe, uh, before the CPE certificates are emailed to you. Um, <clears throat> you will also receive a survey following this presentation. We invite your feedback and comments and appreciate all of those. We will also make a recorded copy of this presentation available to you and send that out to you in an email in uh, a day or so as well. So thank you for your attention today. We wish you a good uh, weekend, rest of the week, and enjoy your weekend. So thank you very much for your attendance.